Well, I'd just like to start off, I guess, by uh, acknowledging that we're here gathering on uh, Jutaroa country, and uh, it's, uh, it's always great to be in Wodonga in this area. Um, I'm also going to just show you something else, and I'll let you read that for a moment, but that's the, the acknowledgement of traditional owners that's in the front of all the basin plan, and it'll be in the basin plan that goes to the parliament in a two weeks' time. I know there's lots of documents that often have a bit of an acknowledgement at the front, but we have to remember we're working under a Water Act which has very little recognition of Indigenous issues, and uh, that, that's, that document was put together by the actual chair. He had a big hand in it himself, and Mildred and Enban representatives. So uh, we're kind of pleased. It actually puts a, bent, um, a peg in the sand a little bit in front of where we have been in the past. Um, so my background, I'm actually a National Parks Manager for most of my career. I, I've had a couple of peaks. I was uh, head of uh, pest animal control for Victoria years ago in my 20s, and I think I peaked in the National Parks world as the Regional Director for Western New South Wales. So my, my background is essentially mainstream natural resource management. So why am I here dealing with Aboriginal issues and working in the Murray-Darling Basin? I thought I'd try and explain part of what motivates me and then that might help you understand why I do what I'm doing. When I was working in Yarram region as the Regional Conservation and Recreation Planner, so that's Gippsland, we had burials come up in middens in a, on a wetland down there, Jack Smith's Lake, and we involved the community from uh, Maui in that area to come and rehabilitate the site, and we got them involved in that project. And that evolved into some work that we got funding for, where they built walking tracks in Wilson's Prom. And, and in that exercise, I developed some really good contacts in the community, and I also came, became really aware of the social issues that were with Aboriginal people in South East Australia. Because it's always been a fair bit of publicity about what happens up north, but a lot more is happening on our doorstep than a lot of us realise. So with that sort of um, touch of uh, working with Aboriginal people pretty closely, and I sort of enjoyed it, I uh, boldly went north and finished up as the operations manager at Kakadu. On the interview panel was this man up here, Big Bill Nyadji, who has a book, he wrote a book called Kakadu Man and was sort of the Aboriginal father of the relationship between national parks and, uh, and uh, the park. He was involved right at the start. And he was on my interview panel because it was a senior position, senior Aboriginal person. And I found out afterwards, you know, I was only tenuously got the job, but it was Big Bill who saw something or latched onto me. So he wanted me at the park, to, taking care of his country. And with that, I had a responsibility to him and he had a responsibility to me. And he taught me heaps. He actually taught me well, he said some really fundamental wisdoms and, and probably one of the ones that I liked best was that uh, for Australia to have a, a reconciled future, he didn't use those words, but if we were going to all live in Australia together, it had to be based on mutual respect. Aboriginal people had to understand whitefellas' culture and we had to actually understand Aboriginal culture and then we could move forward together. He also talked about um, that this is our land and that when you're dead, you'll become part of the land. So while you're alive, it's your responsibility to look after that land because ultimately it's you. And he talked about the land was like his mother and his brother. And it's sort of, eventually I got this overarching um, sense of Bill. He, he entertained uh, a few decades of prime ministers. Every time anyone visited Northern Territory, they'd trot out and see Big Bill and I took lots of ambassadors out to visit him and. He spoke a really broken English and uh, I was sort of used to often be the interpreter and, and liaison person. So we got to be really good friends. But one of the things that became really obvious that his culture drove his identity. It was, drove him and, it, and his culture was based on the land. And then when I came back to southern Australia, the problems down here became even worse because essentially in southeastern Australia, 
Aboriginal people have had the worst of colonisation. They've essentially been pushed off their land, you know, they've had all the pressures and their connection to their land is, is difficult and, and they've got to work to maintain it and I'll talk about that a bit in a moment. But in our, in our programs of closing gaps, or, or it's, there's education issues, there's health issues, there's lots of issues, but I've, I came to the point that if you're working in natural resource management and you actually involve Aboriginal people in getting back to their land through owning it and really having a say in it, and we'll talk about water again in a minute, you can actually be part of them gr grasping back the, the essence of their culture. And with that comes self-esteem and dignity. And it's a lot easier to go to school and be more serious about your health if you've got dignity in yourself and, and your culture. And, and so I decided that if I stuck in this field for a little bit, I could actually probably help make a bit of a difference. So that's fundamentally where I've been coming from for the last uh, decade or so. Sorry about my voice. Oh, and the other thing I should apologise for, this, it's Movember and I'm having a go and <laughs> so I don't normally look like I'm sort of a, a toothbrush on the top of my lip. We'll go quickly through a bit of the background. I'll talk about some Indigenous organisations. I'll talk about some mapping that we've introduced. I'll talk about our consultation and I'll have a bit of a run through on cultural flows and I'll try and pull it all together at the end and show you how we're closing the gap. I'll probably show you the gap in my mind. Okay, we all know the Murray-Darling Basin, you know, down here, we're all familiar. I guess most of you will know a lot about the agriculture. It's 84% of the land in that area is used for agricultural production. There's a population, two million people living in it, food bowl, a sixth of Australia. Yeah, I'm sure you know most of that. What a lot of people don't know is that it's also home to, uh, oh, it's about 10%, the two million is roughly 2%, 20 10% of the population of Australia. It actually has 15% of the po Aboriginal population. There's 75,000 Aboriginal people reside according to the ABS statistics and given that they generally underread for Aboriginal people, um, we have a big significant Aboriginal population in the basin. And one of the things people don't know is that, and they might know, but they probably don't think about it as the real truth, is Aboriginal people own one, less than 1% of the land in the basin. So, people say so. When you're talking about natural resource management though, all the programs for engaging, dis disseminating information generally go out to landholders, to organisations involved in NRM, water licence holders get notices. They're in the game of water management and land management. And Aboriginal people basically miss out. They're just not captured in any consultation processes very often. That's changed over time. There's much more emphasis now. But, you know, it amazes me. I, it doesn't amaze me at all. I've been around for a while in natural resource management and I was there right at the start, or just at the start, when we even started to consider it and we started to think about managing archaeological sites, which was a great start, mid-70s. We won't wreck this midden. We'll look after this scar tree. But that's been the primary focus of engagement in southern Australia for the last 30-something years now. It doesn't take account of what Aboriginal people want to do with the land now and how they want to be involved in the future. It's really looking after their museum, which is great, a great start. We don't ever want to stop doing that, but there is more to it, and that's what we'll try and talk about. Given that I didn't want to do archaeological management, I wanted to do things that were different. I had this sense we were going to be in uncharted water, so hence I'm trying to think about it differently. And given that we were thinking about it differently, I thought, I'm going to try new things. So that means you're working for a government. Governments are generally risk adverse. The public are actually not too adventurous in this area. So I worked with Aboriginal people and we developed a set of principles that we'd respect the roles of traditional owners because when you're talking about culture and land, traditional owners should have, should have the say. We'd make sure we gave plenty of time in all our processes so that they had free, prior and informed consent. We'd improve Aboriginal people's capacity to engage, and that's on lots of fronts. 
We try and deliver social, economic, environmental and cultural outcomes and we try and enter into partnerships um, you know, based on honesty and a capacity to participate equally with um, really sh you know, shared responsibility and, and clearly defined outcomes. We, we came up with that back in 2005 and it's been sort of revamped a little bit and um, essentially it was endorsed again last year. So what are we doing? We're doing these things. We're creating awareness and interest, hopefully interest, hopefully awareness. We're creating representative voices and we're actually helping to inform the debate. And we're trying to engage Aboriginal people um, not as a collective. We want to get lots of voices. We want their voices to be independent and strong and powerful and we don't want to necessarily aggregate them all. So we, I call it sort of independent engagement. We're not trying to block them into one homo homogenous group because that won't work. So the first thing we've done, and some people go, oh, okay, Aboriginal organisations, so what? We've got the Murray Lower Darling Rivers Indigenous Nations. They were actually started in 2008. And uh, so we've been working with them now for uh, well over a decade. And we've started or worked to help initiate this Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations, which uh, started, they're just two years old. Now, the Murray Darling Basin Authority uh, has MOUs, with, has an MOU with Mildren, and it has a, a deed of agreement with which is a more powerful arrangement with NBAN, and we basically supply their funding, the core of their funding. The difference between these and any other Aboriginal advisory group or reference group is that they're completely autonomous. They set their own agenda. They are ASIC-registered companies. Um, they can have meetings when they want, and um, they can operate how they want. Um, they're... Uh, they're they're um, traditional owner based and between the two organisations we cover the whole basin. So what's so adventurous? The adventurous part is really the top bit. Um, both these organisations can act politically. There's not very many advisory committees that can run off and get a meeting with the media or you know, put out press releases and meet with ministers and drive agendas. And what we do as a bureaucracy we focus most of our effort and most of the reason we deal with Mildren is that we try and um, get them on all these sorts of things. We work on um, feeding basically information into um, planning processes. And, and why we want groups like this is because collectively they're now up to I think 47 different nations or you know, we're about to hit 47. If I go and run a process, and I probably could meet 47 Aboriginal nations, I won't get one homogenous view. I'll get a number. It might be 40 odd different views and perspectives, all subtly different. If they all lob in in my group or in the government's office and we actually start amalgamating and deciding priorities, we've corrupted the process. We try and actually get them to do that. They use Aboriginal the protocols, they, whatever they want, but they're actually giving us a collective strategic view. On local issues, they always defer back to the local nations, but on big strategic thinking, which is where we often need to be, we've got an Aboriginal sort of mechanism that des deciphers all the different views. The other bit, so, and they've, they've agreed to work on these three streams. The other, the bottom one is the knowledge, and that's where we work on things like this use and occupancy mapping we'll talk about, cultural flows research, socio-economic information. They develop ways using those processes. They're articulating their, you know, what they often like to say. It feeds into the bureaucratic area and actually underpins what they also can say ministerial, at ministerial level. One of the things after umpteen years and 100 committees I've sat on, uh, it became really obvious. You'd have stakeholder meetings and agricultural sector could be there and They'd all be talking with their economic report under their shoulder, under their arm. They could tell you what the cotton was worth or what, how much water and prove their case that this was good for the nation. An environmentalist, more often than not, can go with a report saying this much water will you know, grow turtles or, or not enough water and the trees will die and it's all documented. And Aboriginal people are often sitting there talking about the relationship and thumping the table 
but their hands are empty. And sadly, the world we work in tends to give uh, more credence to documented, scientific, rigorous you know, positions. And, and in a way, by not working in that lower area, we're continuing to disempower Aboriginal people. So we try and work. We work in the two bottom and they work in the top and we kind of make it all happen. And one of the tools we introduced from Canada, it hasn't been done, hadn't been done in Australia, was a, it's a social science methodology called use and occupancy mapping. I won't go into it today, it's in any detail, it's a talk on its own. But it, the process, we, I came across the concept in mid 2000s and we, we followed this informed consent process. We dealt with Mildren, because NBAN didn't exist then. We got some tentative acceptance that it might be a notion that was worth looking at. We brought out Canada's expert in this area, leading expert. He talked to Mildred. That went kind of well. We visited, I think, uh, six or seven Aboriginal communities down the river in the space of five days, met with three or four government agencies, got a degree of support. We then ran a little pretest um, with a number of individuals who were sort of brave enough to have a go. And still we had a situation where uh, people were saying, ah, it's science. I don't know if any of you have done any research with Aboriginal people, but generally they're pretty sceptical because all the research that they've been involved in is normally done by someone else to them, and more often than not the results end up in another place and that they often say, the next time we see the person, they've gone from being little miss whoever to doctor such and such, and, and, and they actually don't get many benefits and they don't ever feel in control of their information. So getting them to buy in to a research program takes a bit of effort. So they still weren't convinced. So we actually then took them to Canada, not all of them. We took half a dozen pretty, um, what were they, cynical, uh, questioning people who didn't trust the system. And we took these guys, stuck them in a in Vancouver, and we brought a number of sci um, scientists, we brought a number of First Nation leaders to them who'd been involved in use and occupancy mapping, and we just basically ran a series of workshops where we stayed out of it. And they looked at what was, what was the upside, was it hard to do, what were the risks, what were the benefits, etc. And in the end, we came home with six converts who became our advocates for this research. We then ran a pilot, and then we've run some training since and now it's being implemented. And uh, what it does, and I'll, this will help understand, sorry it leaps around, it's not quite all linear, but what we try and do is um, we work with the leadership of a community, and we go in and say, you, you know, they want to do use and occupancy mapping, and use and occupancy mapping is anything but, studying almost anything but archaeology. It's about Aboriginal people's contemporary use of the land. And um, if I ran a little quiz, and I've done it in the past, most people don't, especially in southern Australia, don't believe that Aboriginal people are on the land all that much. Oh, they might do a little bit, but they're not really connected. Up north it's different, and I think that's backed up a little bit by the fact that most institutions, they, and most government agencies too, as soon as they talk about Indigenous research, they all jump on a plane and fly north somewhere. There's not a lot done in southern Australia in reality. So anyway, we work with the community and we say, well, what outcomes do you want from this research? What's the purpose? And then we work on what geographic area, who would you want in it, and then we develop, and what time frame, and then we develop a list of questions that will serve that purpose. And there's a bit of, yeah, there's a fair bit goes into that. Anyway, so you end up with 40 to 60 questions about use of different resources and, and different ways they occupy their land. In that, we then go and run interviews, map-based interviews with individuals, and that's called the individual map biography, gets produced from that. All of those intellectual property on those stay with the individual, never to be sort of, it's theirs. But we do ask them to agree to share their data so it can be aggregated into these themes. Those themes are then, the intellectual property around those belong to the leadership, and they're the, they're the maps that see the negotiating tables when Aboriginal people are trying to show their use of the land for, for natural resource planning. And um, so that, 
And then this one on the end, and I'll show you one of these in a minute, it's really just all the data piled into a map, and it's not particularly useful in some ways, but I think it's great in Australia because it's the myth buster. It actually proves Aboriginal people do use their land. Um, use and occupancy mapping needs the icons. The Canadian set were completely useless. A moose kill site was never going to get used in Australia. So we, we created about 90 of these for the first two projects we ran, and now we have a set of nearly 200 in Australia. But I show them because I think they're kind of nice, but they're also part of the informed consent process. We developed them with Mildren over a series of meetings. We had a little... Um, a whole lot of little sessions where we had a graphic artist and people working with that graphic artist to develop them. But when they were having to draw them and think about it, it actually really got people thinking about, do we want to map where someone died? Do we want to map this? People got their head around it. And so we actually did a kind of a, do we want to be involved in use and occupancy mapping process as well as coming up with a set of icons? And they were great. We ran the pilot, and I'll just quickly, quickly talk about this. From a natural resource management point of view, they definitely work. You can see where people might want water applied in a wetland. You might see where they like to camp and what parts of a river they use. So if you're planning a national park, you wouldn't stick the public camp park right on top of where they might use it. Individually, we had to prove on a bigger scale that this process wasn't like a trip to the dentist. Otherwise, we'd get no one coming through the door. It's voluntary. We found Every individual involved thought the process was great. They thought it was respectful. In fact, over the space of every project, so they run for a month, I get, we all get kissed continually and hugged. People come out crying because they haven't been involved in a process that gives them a chance to express their connection with the land in a way that's so clear and unambiguous and respectful. And Aboriginal people haven't, in Southern Australia particularly, often haven't been afforded that kind of respect. So it worked. As a nation sort of effect on Aboriginal nations, it was really good. It brought lots of people working together on a project that was positive. And uh, the other thing, and it happens in Canada too, a lot of people, Aboriginal people, no different to us in this regard, they often use their land individually. We go fishing here, this other family goes fishing there, not always aware of what each other's doing. When they actually amalgamated all their data, they went, <laughs> We use the land even more than we thought we did as a collective. You know, it worked to really help bind a nation and it raised some awareness. And they're the projects we've got uh, underway at the moment. The first two are more or less complete, just waiting hand back. And down the bottom, we've got a research design phase completed up in Broome. The Murray Darling Basin doesn't go that far yet. I actually take a little bit of leave and I've been working with the Yaru people up there. Um, you all know about the Basin Plan. Well, when we were going out to, to consult on the Basin Plan, we thought, oh, God, getting your head around this is hard. It's hard for anybody. And uh, so what we came up with was this booklet called A Yarn on the River. And it basically um, it underpinned our Indigenous engagement process. It presented the Aboriginal perspectives, pulled them out, made it clear to see, put some background, had a few inspirational quotes and uh, gave it some context that was, and, and some uh, substance that was directly related to Aboriginal people. What else we did... Oh, I'll go back a step. A formal engagement um, process doesn't work for Aboriginal people. Give us your views in writing submitted by... And nowhere in Australia has that ever been particularly successful. We believe, and I don't know how we prove it, but the most submissions prior to this exercise ever received from Aboriginal people was about 60. So we thought 60 submissions, how many thousand are we going to get from everybody else? That won't do. We actually need to hear an Aboriginal voice. So what we did, we had this book to make it a bit easier for people to get their head around it, but we then actually went, worked with Mildred and Enban, and we came up with a list of 20-odd towns, 22 towns, that we would visit for a week. And in the end, we finished up visiting 32 towns and we had two teams running. But what we did that was a bit different, we hired a facilitator in each town who were pre-warning people we were on the way, putting up posters, handing out these, handing out anything else. Then 
we set up like a little workshop or we, we went wherever people went, actually. We were everywhere. Um, and we selected towns that uh, had a real focus on Aboriginality and you know, good population of interest. We went to the Wilcannias and Burks and Broken Hill and Menindies and Cunnamulla and Shepparton and Dubbo and you know, all the towns with a significant uh, Indigenous presence. And so we had the local facilitators, Aboriginal guys or girls, helping us round up people, creating an awareness. We got a lot of media. And we also had us, we, our CMDBA people, one or two of us, handing out the basin plan, handing out these, providing technical advice. But that was all. We then had, and this was the key to our success, we had um, two independent facilitators who uh, could run a computer and could write and worked a fair bit with Aboriginal people. And we put the offer on the table, if you'd like to make a submission, sit down over here and we'll help you write it. Some people used our keyboard, some people gave dictation. We had one lady who writes submissions often for an organisation said, forget this, it's fantastic, I'm giving dictation, you sit there and just listen. People actually thought it was great. And um, so we had some submissions that were half a page long, took half an hour. And they went right through from writing it to we submitted it online with them. They you know, went through the whole process to some that were pages long. And some people started with, when I was a little girl, and, and this was a lady in her 70s, and we got the whole life story. And they came back numerous times. We had cups of tea, we had dinners, you know. But in the end, we finished up with um, uh, the final figures, uh, over 450 Aboriginal submissions. And... They were all started with, you know, tell us about the river, why is it important from you, from, to you, and it evolved out from there. So it was pretty successful. Ah, I've got to give you one spaghetti diagram, just in case there's someone who can follow it. Um, what happened, though, through the process, it became really obvious we were getting much more information than was just relevant to the basin plan, and we were developing a fantastic data set we didn't set out to do it, but we've got 2,000 pages of heartfelt information given to us so we can do something with it and change the environment. So we all started to get weighed down with this responsibility. Oh, good, it's going to go to the basin plan. They can really only consider the bits that are directly affect, related to the basin plan. The rest is really not going to go anywhere. So we thought that would be a, a crime. So we've created this other process. I'll run you through the basics of it. I won't bore you with the whole lot. Up there, I think, I think that's, I'll step around here and then I can see. Up there, there's our submissions. The number's a bit higher than that. We also had 19 Aboriginal organisations who made really detailed submissions. And given this was yarns on a river, we thought, oh, yarns, yarns. We'll call this process yarns woven. And we've got yarns woven one, yarn woven two, yarns woven three, and they're telling stories. Yarns woven one was, there was a lot of talk about socioeconomic impacts of the basin plan. It was all about agriculture generally and small towns. And we all knew there wasn't a lot known about Aboriginal socioeconomic perspectives. So we went and harvested the whole 450 plus through the lens of a socioeconomic analysis. Now, we know it's imperfect, but it showed some... It showed, we got some real information that's useful in some areas and other areas that showed some real gaps. And now our socioeconomic team can go and fill some gaps. And it also involved Aboriginal people in getting their head around what the hell is a socioeconomic study, you know? What bits are social and what's economic and what's it got to do with us? We've actually worked with Mildred and Enban and sort of overcome some of that. So we've finished that one. And uh, we're sort of doing gap analysis and we're now doing in vivo on the whole set so we can revisit it a little bit. The next one we're doing is this Yarns Woven 2, which has another name as well. But it's about answering, in the basin plan, there's some bits that uh, are really relevant to Aboriginal people. The main part that fleshes it out the most is in Chapter 9 on Water Resource Plans, Part 14 lists a whole lot of things that the states have to do when they're making a water resource plan. When we were going through all of that, we had lots of meetings with states and people said, hell, you know, Aboriginal objectives, Aboriginal outcomes, 
uses based on spiritual, cultural, social. How are we going to do that? You've never done it. We've never done it to that detail. This is unfair. Anyway, somehow we've got to push through and it's still in the plan, but from their perspective it probably is unfair. So what we're doing now is we're using this data set to try and answer those questions. We've got some academic sort of dis discussion about uses and values, but we're actually still distilling it down to here's what a model template for the a water resource plan could look like based on the whole, if the whole basin was a water resource plan using 450 plus voices. So, and we're working with states on what the water resource plan might look like, so it's a bit easy and it's relevant. So that'll help the states, we think, but there's more to it than that. Chapter 9 also says the Murray-Darling Basin Authority will consult with Mildred and Enban in doing their accreditation of this part of the water resource plan. So we've got a, Aboriginal people and we're going to involve in con, accreditation, and then we've got Aboriginal people who are going to be involved out at the state end who are going to be writing the plan. And it's really important. Everybody's expectations are on some field that's somewhere similar. Otherwise, we're going to end up with accreditors wanting one thing and other people writing a plan miles apart, and you'd have a you know, complete impasse. So this document now becomes the document that we deal with states. We discuss, is that reasonable? Are we in the right ballpark? And then the beauty of it is that when they say, OK, and they are so far there, we're early days. This is not finished, but we've had first talks. People are saying, this will be useful. This could help. It also means when they go out to their Aboriginal communities and they're doing their water resource planning, they'll be able to say, uh, there were fellows here last year talking about water, and this is what you said. And the beauty of that is that they actually say, because step out of that conversation, mostly when I go to an Aboriginal community, I'm a white fellow who works on water. When someone from the CMA goes, it's a white fellow who works on water. State, white fellow who works on water. They're not really differentiating. And if the states go out, they'll say, you were here last year. You told us the same set of questions. Didn't you listen? And so we've got some generic or some, some general agreement that we'll actually try and collaborate here. Yay, collaboration. <laughs> and so what they're going to do is use this data, or well, they might, some have sort of agreed to, early days, but they'll go back and say, look, last year in Cunnamulla, you said this sort of information. The beauty with it is it has a number of things. First, it shows someone was listening and someone took notice and then they accurately recorded it. But it allows people then to say, OK, on reflection, that's not so important. But this is more important. And if you actually go back with some information, you can get more complexity and more layering. If you keep going with a blank sheet of paper, you keep getting the base information over and over, six months, 12 months. So we think that'll actually help everybody and get a better outcome. And we bring Mildred and Enban along so that they think it's being run properly and they might accredit it at the end. So that will stop that impasse. So that's that, that one. Sorry to prattle on, but that's really exciting. And it um, was unintentional at the start, unplanned, but it, it will be useful. This one, although, and now that one and this one, primarily government processes. And because we like to give something back, or I'd like to, I'm hoping this Yarns Woven 3, the mob's voice, is we actually give Mildred and Enban a bit of capacity and get them to go back with the data as well and say, look, this is what we all said, and for them to create their own sort of document that they can use for their own purposes, representing their communities, that then might become the political thing. Like ours will come out of what's good water resource planning. They'll be able to take their report whatever direction they want. And uh, so it gives something back to them, and it actually helps them in that political world, we think. And they're pretty keen on that. I was, I was talking to an NBAN executive a little while ago, and at the end of it, I said, what do you think? They said, yeah, what are you sitting here for? Get going, do it. I said, I've got to get money. They said, don't worry about it, you just do it. And, you know, so now I think I've probably saddled myself with a problem, but a good one. Cultural flows. That's a lady, Cheryl Buchanan, who's a prominent uh, Aboriginal leader in Queensland. So now we get on to cultural flows, changing gears. Um, cultural flows is new. 
it, it's newer than most of us realise. It's starting to pop up in the language and lexicon all over the place, but it really didn't get... It's not 10 years old, the concept even, really. I can't find anything that goes back much further than that. In fact, when I look back through history, it's only since the mid-70s, really, that even environmental flows were being t conceived, or the concept. So this is sort of the... Uh, a bit of the history. They're the main players in the early days of cultural flows. The Achuka Declaration was where it sort of the rubber starts to hit the ground. 60 to 70 Aboriginal people got together in Achuka. They had a, a lawyer who gets left out a little bit, a guy named an Aboriginal lawyer named Tony McAvoy, facilitate, and he helped them and a bunch of us work together and we created a thing they called the Achuka Declaration which provided a definition for cultural flows. This is the broad brush definition. It goes on for a couple of pages with lots of components. A fantastic start, but as if I put my land manager's hat on, really hard to operationalise. You know, it's sort of there as a definition, but what does it really mean? How do you measure it? What does it, what will it mean? And the previous chair of Mildred, and I'm allowed to talk about him, he passed away last year, no, the year before, two years ago now. He was often badgered, you know, tell us about cultural flows. How much water do you really need? Because he's always in these forums. And he said, I'm not telling them. Well, we said, we don't really know, but I don't want to state a figure too early because we might underbid and we might miss out. And it, and it would be premature. And, and I really like that. But that's what this definition kind of brings on. It's there, but the answers are not really there. So we're working on research. We got together, Mildred and Enban, with us helping, created a, a research plan that they developed into a, a, a serious sort of project. And it's managed by Aboriginal people. It's managed by the National, National Cultural Flows Research and Planning Committee. It's now hosted by the National Native Title Council out of Melbourne. That's who they are. There's th that first group, the Indigenous Water Advisory Committee, is an organ committee that's just been set up that advises SUPAC, but it's kind of evolved from the First Peoples Water Engagement Council that used to advise the National Water Commission. So it's a national focus group. We then have Mildred and NBAN. And we have NAILSMA, the Northern, North Australian Indigenous Land and Sea Management Alliance, which is a collective of all the, um, the um, oh, what are they called? All the lands councils across Northern Australia. And this group focused on water and land. And they adopted Mildred's uh, uh, definition. And then we've got the uh, Western Australian group who don't actually attend the meetings and just have a watching booth. So they actually are driving it and running it. We have to do it because there's enough bits of mentions in legislation, there's enough international obligations to point us that direction, but the truth is government doesn't know how to do it yet and one of the things we want to do is make sure our research or this research benefits Aboriginal people first. Um, what I should do... Uh, let's think. All right, let's... I'll leave that up there, but fundamentally the problem with the definition was it didn't tell you, if you were trying to operationalise it, it didn't tell you which values, how, what values, how would you measure the values. And if I'm a water manager and I'm going to water a wetland, how would I know when I was successful? How would they be able to tell us it was successful? And given that the water we're going to be dealing with is going to be worth millions of dollars, it doesn't take a lot of water to be worth millions, we have to actually be able to, to flesh it out. And that doesn't mean we're going to stand back and be voyeuristic and want to go into the depth of every cultural outcome that, to the point that it's intrusive. But what we'll end up with, we hope, is a number of surrogates that will demonstrate culture. And the best one I can use, and again this goes back to Uncle Matt, he's sort of allowed us to use this story. He's a Naranjeri man, was a Naranjeri man, and his nachi, or um, totem, was the swan. So if he owned water, and he could water a wetland and create a swan breeding event, he actually was satisfying his cultural responsibilities to look after swans. His community then would collect eggs, 
eat young, odd young swans, collect feathers for decorations, and then have ceremonies. So th from a swan breeding event, a successful season, a whole lot of cultural outcomes could be delivered. All we need to know as water managers, once we understand that, is get the swans to breed. And that, could be a, that, that ticks cultural boxes. So if we can get some surrogates around the basin like that, we don't have to actually interrogate Aboriginal people about why do you want this and tell us how, but we'll have enough science to support that it's real because it needs to be real because you won't get the water and it's worth a lot of money unless we do that. So the second part was, so you've got some values, how much water do you want? Well, it's a pretty tricky question and how long do you want it for and when? So we're going to create a number of case study sites throughout the basin and we'll actually trial it and run models and we'll get estimates of water so that we can at least sort of know what to bid and what sort of quantities we might need to get cultural outcomes. So, so we've got the question set. We know what values, we know how much water, when, where. The next obvious question, and this is from a system that isn't really rushing to give Aboriginal people water, is how would you manage it? And uh, so we've got a bit on governance. We'll look at all the different models that from would you break it up into a dozens and dozens of parcels? Would you create at the other end some trust or a, an Aboriginal water holder advised by a committee? So we'll look at governance. The other thing we'll do, and uh, I've heard this pretty often, won't environmental water just deliver this stuff? Can't, won't that do the job? We'll actually have a discussion paper on the difference between, or the comparison between cultural water and environmental water. Because I think what, and my prediction is, that will show environmental watering doesn't necessarily deliver cultural outcomes, but cultural outcomes will deliver environmental outcomes. And which means a clever government could get more bang for the one buck. But that's a personal opinion. So anyway, this research is now underway, and, uh, and we'll be looking at all the benefits and trying to measure those. I miss this button occasionally. Okay. This committee was all Aboriginal people. They weren't silly Aboriginal people, though. They knew they needed advice, and they had these scientists advise them. I don't know if you know most of them, but they're all professors or associate professors with one university or another across a number of disciplines, and they're all people who agreed that they wouldn't tender for any of the work. They were interested in the project from this point of view, so they supported the committee, helped devise the research proposal, so... Um, so it is about as professional and as thorough and rigorous as we could be. Nobody wants this research to get a certain way down the track and then be shot down because of poor methodology or bad thinking, poor research design. There are the outcomes. I think I pretty much went through those before, so we can jump through that. But it's really important that this research is done before we proceed too far because otherwise we'll be really travelling in the dark and there's too many pitfalls out there. The timeline, we actually only finished the research proposal late last year. We contracted out the National Native Title Council in April. They've got a project officer sitting down there. Um, it's going to run from now out for four whole years. Um, component one's commenced. The first component is a really exhaustive literature review and not only just the academic literature, they're going to delve into all the grey literature done in government agencies and projects here and there. So this committee can't be shot down by, oh, did you know that happened and you didn't need to do that? They don't want that to happen. So they're trying to eliminate that. And then the next component, which uh, we'll be looking at the values, hopefully will be advertised in the next month or so. The project has a budget notionally of four and a half million of four point six six million dollars over the four years. The Murray Darling Basin Authority has committed a million dollars over that time. Um, they're now seeking more funding. They received a little bit of money in the last days of the National Water Commission and they've just received a hundred thousand dollars from Faxia to keep them going for a bit longer. So I think they'll get there and they'll eventually be going to uh, philanthropic circles and uh, and looking for you know private public partnership approach. Okay, here's the gap part of the story. We're nearly there. <laughs> Most of you know when we're looking at the water resources, historically, and I don't think I'd be any sort of heretic saying 
For the best part of the last century, water was used to serve agriculture. We know that story pretty well, and we know the results of that, it's had adverse impacts on the environment. We know now that um, we need environmental flows. That's what I was talking about earlier. From the 70s, no one had heard of them, to now they're mainstream. And this is simplified, please don't shoot me down, but um, the, the point I guess I'm trying to make is over this side, water's used, growing crops, turning that into dollars, which really leads to well-being for, for the individual. The farmers are in it for well-being and the communities get well-being type returns. Australia gets food and gets an economy or gets a jolt to the economy in the right direction. But it's been at the expense of some environment. And I just did a talk the other day on the Living Murray and I had to go back and it was a history of the Living Murray. And I think we all forget that the river was really degraded, the wetlands were really degraded at the start of the drought. Everyone keeps saying, oh, it's all the drought. But now the floods have come, it's right. But this, the old way that we were running the river had the river in trouble before, at the very start of the drought. Ten years on, it got worse. But, but the, we, we, uh, there's agreement. There was, the Water Act went through Parliament because the system wasn't working. We're now looking out this direction. And we're looking at how we can rebalance it. And generally, and this is where I think any researcher should be interested, Generally, the, the paradigm at the moment, the thinking is this versus that, getting a balanced, healthy working basin. But I'm throwing that in now because I think that's the gap that we need to fill, the knowledge gap. Aboriginal people need water and through cultural flows and they'll get their cultural benefits and that's where their well-being's being fed from. And we've just reinforced that these 450 submissions, one of the overarching messages through the whole lot is sick rivers, unhealthy environments, sick Aboriginal people. Communities fall into disarray, all sorts of social issues happen, there's lots of social costs. There's a whole field here that hasn't really been factored into this arrangement. And not that numbers are everything, but if there's 75,000 people here, they're not all living on the river, I'll give you that. But it didn't matter where we interviewed people, they have enough connection with the environment, Aboriginal people, the ones we interviewed and others, that if it's sick, they're not really good either. Things are not good. They just don't feel good. Their culture's being threatened. And there's 15,000-odd irrigation businesses. Not that numbers matter, but if there were four people per family in these businesses, the numbers are not dissimilar. And I just sort of throw that out for people to think about. There is another whole field of thinking that needs to be injected into this. And it's not in the thinking now. It's not in how water managers factor in river management. But I'll bet you they weren't thinking about this 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Give it another 10 years and this will have grown in prominence, fed by things like that cultural flows research, Mildred and NBAN. So that's really uh, the message I was sort of trying to convey, that we're working with Aboriginal people on a number of levels, and it is going somewhere, slowly but surely. And the Basin Plan has lots more Aboriginal involvement in it than, than the Water Act really insisted upon, and there's lots of things like our, uh, our acknowledgement that are happening. So that's really the story. Thank you.